So today is the last day of our Family Matters series. Uh, all the way back, if you can remember back to the beginning of May, we began this journey, right, where we were going to examine how God designed the family to function. And we recognize that, I mean, we recognize that every family, you know, I mean, all families are different, right? Every, families come in every shape and, and size, and, and that familial relationships vary, but we wanted to see uh, what God intended uh, for us when he created families. Does uh, what we uh, are experiencing in our homes match up with what we see in Scripture? Was it really supposed to be this way? And, uh, and so since that time, we have taken a long look at marriage. We've talked about uh, conflict in the home and parenting and, and mothers and grandparents and children. And if you've missed any of these, I encourage you to go back, go to, go to our website. You can find all the messages there. Uh, you go to our Facebook page, wherever. Uh, but by now, we, we know that God designed the family so that he might live in the family, and that he might move among the family, right? Just like our hearts, God desires to dwell in our homes. In fact, he desires that, that place of prominence that we might prioritize godly living in our relationships. Simply put, our relationships should be a reflection of him. A reflection of him. And so today on Father's Day, uh, we're going to end by looking at fatherhood. Fatherhood, specifically the heart of the father. And so if you have your Bible with you today, and I hope that you do, please turn with me to the book of Romans. The book of Romans, you're going to find Romans in the New Testament right after Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. But we are going today to Romans chapter 8. Romans 8, beginning, uh, we're going to begin in verse 12 today. The words are going to be on the screen. Uh, please follow along as I read the word of God aloud. So then, brothers and sisters, we are not obligated to the flesh to live according to the flesh. Because if you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all those led by God's Spirit are God's sons. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Instead, you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself tes testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children, and if children, also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. Thanks be to God for his word. The Apostle Paul, he wrote this letter to the Romans, uh, probably during his third missionary journey, I don't know, somewhere around 57 AD. Uh, but like a lawyer presenting a, a legal argument, uh, Paul is slowly and methodically making a case for salvation found not in the law, but in the finished work of Jesus Christ. His primary goal for the, for the church of Rome, his primary goal was that, uh, that, that the, the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians might be united as one in the gospel. See, see, Jewish Christians, they, they thought that, they, they knew from the start, right, since birth, they knew they were God's people. They knew they were God's people. They were born of natural descent and could trace their lineage back to Abraham. However, the Gentile Christians, not so much, right? They are new to God's favor, 
I mean, up until this point, they had not been a part of the family of God. And so we get to this passage in chapter 8, where in many ways, Paul sort of reaches this apex here in these verses that we just read. I mean, obviously, he's talking about the Holy Spirit here, but, but if you think about this, if you zoom out for just a little bit, right, there had, where there had been this rift between Jews... As in those who saw themselves naturally as children of God and Gentiles, those who were uh, not naturally born children of God, Paul makes it clear that all who have been saved by Jesus Christ uh, have been adopted by the Father, that all have been adopted by the Father. And so he makes it clear in the chapters leading up to this, uh, he, he's talking about how the law was unable to accomplish the work of salvation. It was deficient. But by using this language of adoption, by using this language of adoption, the Jewish reader would be clear on their need to be adopted as well. To be adopted as well. See, see, under, under Roman adoption, the life and standing of the adopted child changed completely. The adopted son lost all rights in his old family. Hear me now. Lost all rights in his old family and gained all new rights in his new family. The old life of the adopted son was completely wiped out. All debts canceled, nothing from the past counting against them anymore. And the same thing is true of the Gentiles, right? The same thing is true. And so so Paul, he's calling on on those Jewish Christians, right, to detach themselves from their traditions and from their practices and from the beliefs of their earthly family and to attach themselves to their new life in Christ in the true family of God. See, this one thing, This one thing, the adoption into the family of God, would become the basis for everything else moving forward. In the... uh in his book called Knowing God, J.I. Packer, he, he says that adoption is the highest privilege that the gospel offers, even higher than the blessings of justification, because it brings us into this richer relationship with God as our loving Father. He goes on to say that the the entire Christian life has to be understood in terms of it. That would be adoption, right? He illustrates the the Sermon on the Mount. So so the Sermon on the Mount that you find in, in the book of Matthew is the basis of Christian conduct as we imitate the Father. It's at the root of glorifying the Father as people see our good works and they glorify their Father in heaven. It's at the heart of pleasing the Father as we, you know, God the Father sees our hearts rather than the hypocrites who who practice uh, self-righteousness before men. Adoption is at the the, the basis of Christian prayer, right? Since, Since Jesus teaches us to pray, our Father who is in heaven. Adoption is the basis of our life of faith as we trust in our Father to provide for our needs. In an age plagued by fatherlessness, and we are, this is such an important message. There are a few things I want us to see about the character of God and how we can reflect the heart of the Father. And so if you're taking notes, the first one's this, right? A father gets involved, a father gets involved, right? Romans 8, 15, right? 8, 15 says, For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Instead, you received the spirit of adoption. Paul's talking about a previous state and a previous response. You and I were in slavery. 
We were born into slavery. We were enslaved by sin. Our parents had been slaves, and their parents had been slaves, and their parents' parents, and all the way back to Adam and Eve had been slaves. And Paul says it very plainly in Ephesians chapter 2. He says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previously walked according to the ways of the world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and our thoughts, and we were by nature children under wrath, as others were also. See, we were in a slavery of our own doing. Just like Adam and Eve, we were naked and afraid, and God came to us. And God came to us, right? He didn't wait for us to come to him, knowing that we were in darkness and in fear. He came to us. It was our burden to bear, but he chooses to bear the burden himself. He takes what was our load, what was our baggage, what was our problem, and he puts it on himself. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5 says, When the time came to completion, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. See, the heart of the Father is compelled by love to get involved. He fully commits, and his commitment to redeem us results not only in our salvation, but our adoption as sons and daughters. We were orphans. We were, I mean, he was under no obligation whatsoever to get involved. He had much to lose, and we had everything to gain. The cost was great, and the burden was placed solely on his beloved son, Jesus Christ. If that's what our heavenly father does for his sons and daughters, then shouldn't we love our children in the same way? I mean, we've, we've heard the comments before, right? We've heard that uh, mom's away, dad's watching the kids. Oh, you mean being a dad? Okay. Dads, you, you're not a babysitter. You're a dad. God is not a babysitter. He doesn't just watch over us, make sure we don't get in too much trouble. God didn't just spin the world into existence and sit back and watch it all just burn. He's the opposite of distant and disconnected. He's near and he's involved. Your problems become God's problems. My problems become God's problems. If it's big enough for you, it is big enough for God to get involved. And that's what he does, right? Lest we become slaves to our own fears and our own worries. Dads, in the same way, in the same way, we should be attentive to our children and engage them where they are. So many times, dads are so fixated on being successful. They're so invested in their business that they leave the raising of their children, the training and the transferring that we talked about just a couple weeks ago to somebody else. Our flesh, our flesh just pulls us towards power, money, position, and status. But I assure you, our children do not love us for that. In fact, I don't don't even think they care about it. We believe that certain things are, we we convince ourselves that certain things are necessary to provide for our family. I have to do that. But, But at what cost? At what cost? God's not impressed with that new title that uh, I just got. But it comes with a raise. No, 
He don't care. He's not impressed. He didn't call us to that. He called us to be involved in the disciple-making business. And if we're, about, if we're gonna be about his business, the business of our father, then we need to be uh, the father of our children. I mean, think about it like this. If you don't do your job as an employee, your work, your business, your company will find someone else to do it. If you don't do your job as a dad, that job remains unfilled. Your child will be absent a father because being a father is more than a role, it's a responsibility. You may convince yourself that you're doing what's best, making money and providing for the family, but other people can do your job. Other people can do it. You don't need it. Other people cannot be a dad for you. And so we need to do the things that only we can do. Do those things first. Don't be uh, content to abdicate your role as a uh, father, your fatherly responsibilities to your wife. As great as mom is, and moms, you're great. They cannot be a dad. And so a godly father is going to communicate and collaborate with his wife for sure, but he will also be intimately involved in rearing the children whom God has entrusted to him. The next thing we need to see is that a father provides security. A father provides security. See, in the Roman world, adoption was a very serious matter. It was a very serious matter. An adopted son was a, uh, a son who would deliberately be chosen by his adoptive father to perpetuate his name and to inherit his estate. See, they would have all the rights and the privileges of all of those bearing the name of the father. Any adopted son would not be inferior uh, in status to any natural born son. And this, this is what the Lord has done for us. We were orphans. We had nothing, right? We were deserving of nothing, but God got involved. He knew our broken condition. He knew it. He wasn't duped. He knew our broken condition. He knew what state we were in. Anybody else is going to look at us and go, man, that's a lost cause. A terrible investment. What a waste. And unfortunately, some of you may have heard those words from your own father. But God steps in and adopts us. He steps in and adopts us. He says, I will provide for you. And we will be provided for in every way. At that moment, God not only assumes the responsibility and the liability for us, but he also bestows on us the rights and the privileges of a son or daughter. He would look after us. He would care for us. And it's in that relationship that we would have meaning and purpose. This relationship of father and child would be the strong foundation underneath everything else. We would no longer be slaves to fear, but we could stand firm knowing that we are beloved sons and daughters of God. Paul writes, he says, for you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but instead you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, Abba, Father, I mean, there is security. There is security in knowing that I am his and he has a hold of me. Many of you have memories of, uh, of your, your toddler taking their first steps. Remember what that was like? Think back. They get the courage to let go of what they're holding on to. And they sort of wobble towards you with outstretched arms. They're sort of reaching for you. 
And you're there, you're cheering them on, and, but they're doing all they can to get to you. They're trusting, but you're not going to let them fall. Fast forward a few years. The same child is learning to ride the bike. And they're kind of pedaling. You're holding on to the back seat, right? And they're pedaling faster and faster. And they say, don't let go, Daddy. Don't let go. They feel secure as long as you're holding on to them. In the middle of the night, a child cries out, and they cry out for the one who will make them feel secure. Perhaps even a child may, may be uh, comfortable getting out of bed. They will go down the hall, and perhaps they'll crawl into bed with mom and dad. They feel comforted. They feel secure, and they fall right asleep. As Christians, our security, our security is in the one whom we cry out to. I mean, woe to those who cry out for anyone but Abba, Father. Woe to them. I mean, we've talked about this before, that the the Abba is an Aramaic word that means father. It was a common term expressed, uh, that it expressed affection and confidence and trust, but it was used in close, intimate relationships like that of a father and his child. Abba means daddy. Daddy. We cry out daddy because we know that he will hear us. We know that he will come when we cry out. We know that he will answer our cries. We are comforted by his presence. And if and if we should ever doubt that we belong to him, if we should ever doubt how he feels about us, if we ever uh, allow the fear to creep back in, or if our accuser, Satan, should try to convince us of lies, his spirit tells us over and over and over again that we don't have to go back there. We are safe at home with God because God is our Father. Romans 8, 16 says, the Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. In the Roman world, an adoption was witnessed by uh, up to seven people. Seven people. Seven witnesses. These people, they would testify in the event that the adoption was ever disputed. Let's say the adoptive father dies and, and suddenly there's a, there's a disagreement, there's a dispute. These seven will speak up for they witnessed it. And that's what the Spirit does. The Holy Spirit testifies that we have a father. The Holy Spirit testifies that we have a Father, that we belong to Him. He's never going to send us back. He has a hold of us, and He's not going to let go. We are affirmed, and He reminds us who we are, how He feels about us, and that nothing will ever change that. I mean, if you're a parent, don't you desperately want that for your child i mean i want i want my girls to know that my love for them is not based on anything they do or they don't do it's not something that varies depending upon the season it doesn't change with the times i want them to be secure in who they are to me My fathering of them, thus, must be based on my being a child of the Father. Anything else is simply just going to fall short. But I'm a child of the Father, and so my, because I am secure, I can make sure my children are secure in their relationship with me. The last thing we need to see today is that a father blesses his children. What a blessing it is to have a father like that. I mean, picking up in verse 16, it says, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And if children, 
also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. Notice this with him thing. With him. The father and the child together with him. We are with him. Him. I mean, if we're in Christ, we are heirs of God. We are co-heirs with Christ. I mean, think about that for just a second. What extravagance. What extravagance, right? The king of the universe chose to adopt us, and now we're princes and princesses. What? We started at the bottom, and now we're here. Right? We have an inheritance from God. I'm the beneficiary of God. I mean, that, that, that's what the rich young ruler could never wrap his mind around, right? That he wanted to know how, uh, what he could do to inherit eternal life. But it's not about doing something. It's about belonging to someone. It's not a matter of doing, it's a matter of being. And if you have been adopted by God, then you have it all. You have it all. Your daddy, your Abba father is the king of the universe. As Peter says, because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. It's not going to appreciate or depreciate, okay? It's not like the stock market, all right? Your inheritance is secure. Your inheritance is secure. It's kept for you in heaven. And what did we do to deserve that? Nothing. And what do we get? everything. I mean, it's like, it's like the prodigal father in Luke chapter 15. He, he forgives his wayward son, and then he just lavishes grace upon grace upon him. You know, he puts a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and he grabs the best robe, his robe. He grabs his robe and puts it around him, and he gives him a kiss, right? He, he throws a party in his honor, killing the fattened calf. We deserve none of that, and yet God gives it to us. I mean, Jesus himself, he made it clear, right, that our Father delights to give us the kingdom. He wants to. He wants to give us the kingdom. And we should be the same way with our children. I mean, does that mean that we give our children everything we want? No! That's a terrible idea. God doesn't do that for us. Does that mean that we never discipline our children? No, that's a terrible idea. God disciplines us, and it's how we know that we are truly sons and daughters. So what is it? It's that our children should feel more loved with us than not. That our children should know more about God by spending time with us. Our children should exhibit more of God's character by imitating us as we imitate him. We should leave a spiritual inheritance to our children and our children's children. As sons and daughters of God, we are blessed just by being with the Father. We are together with him. And the same thing should be true in our homes as well. Too often I hear stories about dads who seem to do more harm than good. I mean, it's almost like they're showing their children what not to do. And there are children who have seen what happens when dad drinks too much. They now know that self-indulgent partying is permissible. There are children who have listened as daddy has attacked them verbally. They now know it's acceptable to yell and curse at those you love. There are children who have never heard the words, I love you, from their dad. There are children who think they will never be good enough because of how they were pressured 
to meet a certain standard and how they were disciplined when they failed. I mean, there's a reason we have a term called daddy issues. There's a reason why uh, Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 6 that fathers don't stir up anger in your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. I mean, Paul, he's pleading for men not to neglect the ministry that they have at home. The best thing you can do for your children is to train them and instruct them in the Lord. It takes time, yes, about 18 years, plus or minus. It takes patience, yes, all you got. It takes endurance, absolutely, blood, sweat, tears. But it's worth it. It's difficult, but being a father after God's own heart is not as complex as maybe we like to make it. I mean, we have, we have been blessed to be a blessing. We are the beneficiaries of a doting father who has given us blessing upon blessing, and we're to do the same. Dads, we can, we can make this happen because we have the best Father to model it for us. We have a loving Father in heaven who will give us everything we need. I'd like to close the day a little bit differently. As the worship team comes, I'd like for us to pray over all the, the dads and the future dads here, all the men. If you are sitting next to a dad or a future dad, would you just put, their, put your hand on their shoulder? You don't need to get out of your seat. Just, just extend a hand. If, if you're not around anyone, just, just stick a hand in the air. The Lord can sort it out later. But let's pray over all the men in this place. Lord, we affirm these men. God, you have called each of us. Whether we are uh, fathers of, of naturally born children, fathers of adopted children, fathers of, of, of fatherly figures of others, Lord, we, we affirm these men. We say that you made them, you knit them together in their mother's womb, that you have purpose for them, that you have a plan for their life, and you love them. Lord, we recognize that there is nothing greater than being known as an adopted son of the king. There's nothing greater but Lord, we also recognize that there is a holy calling over each man here to shepherd their family, to steward their gifts, the ones that they have been given by you, to train and direct and to lovingly guide those in their care. And so Lord, we encourage these men to step into that calling to be the men that you have created them to be. Just as you have poured your life into them. God, we pray that they would pour their lives into others. That they would humbly serve others just as you did. Just as you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to serve and not be served, Lord, I pray that these men wouldn't just be a dwelling place for you, but they would be living sacrifices for you. Lord, may this Father's Day be a day of consecration where we choose to love as you have loved us, where we choose to exhibit the character that you have shown us in your word. And where we choose, God, that we might have a heart that seeks to bless, that seeks to provide, that seeks to get involved. 
in the lives of children. Lord, we lift up today those who, uh, who do not have an earthly father. Lord, give us eyes as a church to recognize that and to get involved. For God, your love compels us. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.